This is Air in Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity providing information and support for those of us living with pain and for healthcare professionals. I'm Paul Evans, and this edition has been supported by friends and supporters of Pain Concern. Now, the eminent neuroscientist Patrick Wall was one of the founding fathers of pain research. One of his legacies was that he trained many of the leaders in pain research today, so it comes as no surprise that the annual Patrick Wall Lecture in his memory is awarded to established senior clinicians, academic experts or pioneers who have advanced the science or art of pain medicine practice. The 2015 Patrick Wall Lecture took place at the British Pain Society's annual scientific meeting in Glasgow. It was given by Andrew Rice, who is Professor of Pain Research at University College London. I first entered pain research because of a particular patient. I was doing oncology and as a very junior doctor and we had a patient who was dying, a young man who had a tumour invading, a lung cancer invading uh, the nerves that go down to the arm, the brachial plexus. And there was nothing that could really touch his pain and it was a horrible way for him to die and it was a great lesson. So I started to read about pain research and that was at the time when Patrick Wall was really at his pomp and uh, making huge contributions. So I, I had this intractable clinical problem on the one side and a hugely exciting area of basic research on the other and they just seemed to marry up to me and that has um, remained my stimulus ever since. Now I'm not going to ask how old you were but Let's say that that patient was 20 years ago. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Considerably okay. more. <laughs> 20 years plus then. Can I ask what has changed since then? How would you view that patient today? Some things have changed. Other things have not changed. Our understanding of neuropathic pain in particular has changed unrecognisably. We understand a huge amount about the mechanisms and that different types of diseases that can cause neuropathic pain. It's not only cancer, we can see it, for example, in diabetes or areas I work in particularly, which are infection. We have more techniques to be able to treat the pain in those patients. They're mainly drug-based. There's very little evidence to support other techniques for, for relieving neuropathic pain in particular. And those drugs are certainly better than they were some 35 years ago but they are still rather modest in their efficacy and they give people side effects, so there's a long way to go. Explain to me what neuropathic pain is. Neuro is the nerves, the nervous system. Yes. So neuropathic pain is um, pain that is directly caused by damage to the nervous system. So that could be trauma, for example, an injury to a nerve, or it can be damage to nerves caused by diabetes. What distinguishes neuropathic pain from any other, in fact Patrick Wall was one of the first people to point this out, is that most sorts of pain are useful to us in a perverse sort of way. If you've got an inflamed joint, the pain tells you that perhaps you shouldn't be moving that joint as much as you should. Uh, if you stick your hand on a hot coal, the pain will tell you to take your hand away. Neuropathic pain is, if you like, a disease of the pain system. It's something's gone wrong with pain processing. There is no painful stimulus but people feel this spontaneous uh, pain, and often for many, many years. So it has no biological function. It's, it's a sort of disease of the pain system, if you like. And you see it in the context of many, many different diseases. Uh, my own area of particular interest is infectious diseases. So it's the brain's pain signal working in overdrive when it shouldn't be working at all. Yes, uh, exactly. But it's not just the brain. It's also the nerves that go out to your skin. It's the whole passage of painful information from the very tips of your finger right up through the spinal cord to the brain. All aspects of that are involved. In fact, one of the downsides of uh, Patrick Wall's massive contribution was that he focused mainly on the spinal cord. And it's taken us some 30 or 40 years to wake up the fact that there's quite an important part of pain that sits above the spinal cord called the brain. You know, we couldn't look at the brain 30 years ago. There was no real techniques. So, so now with modern brain scanning techniques, uh, the people who do that kind of work are telling us huge amounts about the brain and pain. And we know that there are profound changes in the brain in people who've had nerve injury. So what's going on, do you think? One of the biggest questions is why not everybody with a nerve injury doesn't develop neuropathic pain? It's only about 25% of them. It's absolutely dreadful for that 25%. 
why only about 20% of people with diabetes develop a painful neuropathy or nerve damage. And it's trying to understand those differences, what differentiates that person from that person, why someone gets pain that is important. What we think is going on pathologically, if you like, in, in terms of what's uh, in the people that do get pain, is we think that this is a, an attempt by the nervous system to repair itself, and it goes wrong, and you get short circuits and things like that, to put it crudely. One of the great mysteries is it doesn't seem to happen very often in children, very young children. I'm not an expert in that area, but um, it certainly seems to be the case. And maybe their nervous system is more able to change itself correctly. I'm trying to think about how that works. If I had an electrician in my house to mend a light bulb or to change a light yeah. bulb, and he did something very fancy that took out the whole electrics in the house, yes. For no reason, that could be neuropathic pain? Yes, in a way. And, and the light bulb starts coming on where it shouldn't come on. I think one of the best examples of neuropathic pain that, that most people can understand is something we've been quite interested in this year, particularly with the anniversary of the First World War, is people who get pain following amputations of legs or arms, and uh, so-called phantom limb pain. That's a type of neuropathic pain. They're feeling pain in a leg that isn't there anymore. And that's a, quite a graphic way of describing what neuropathic pain is. Another feature of it is some people feel pain where they're numb, which is counterintuitive. You shouldn't, that doesn't make any sense to some people. A lot of our patients find difficulty in finding the right words to describe their pain because it fits outside your normal experiences and sensory experiences. But to feel pain where you're also feeling numb seems to be very odd, but that is exactly what is going on. A friend of mine describes it as like putting your hand in hot water, yes. a burning sensation that he can't move away from. Yes, that is exactly the description many of our patients give, particularly the ones who have diabetes or nerve damage associated with HIV infection. Continuous burning sensation never leaves them, particularly bad at night often. One of the best descriptions of it came from a source that we've only recently found, uh, someone who was way ahead of his time, uh, a man called Weary Dunlop, who was an Australian doctor and soldier, and he was a prisoner in, of war in Malaya. And th those people got neuropathic pain because th their nerves were damaged by starvation, essentially. And he gives a very um, succinct and, and evocative description of it and that I still use in all my lectures to introduce it. The, the people who had it, of course they had no shoes, they felt a continuous burning sensation that never left them and they were suddenly also got attacks of lightning attacks of pain. Their feet were so sensitive they couldn't even sleep. One of the things that has happened over the last few years is we've come to, both in, in laboratory research into neuropathic pain and clinical research and clinical practice, we've come to regard neuropathic pain as a single entity. Whatever disease is uh, underlying it, whether it's diabetes or, a, or an injury or side effect of being treated with certain drugs to treat cancer, and we've tended to lump them all together, and that's the way we've done the clinical trials of new treatments. And that may be a huge oversimplification because most people in clinical practice and many of our patients will tell us that we know that certain drugs have an effect in some people but they seem to be ineffective in others and we can't understand why that patient uh, responds very well to this drug and this patient has no response at all to exactly the same drug. So one of the important things in the field at the moment is to try and understand how patients with the same disease differ in the characteristics of their neuropathic pain, whether it's the symptoms they tell you about. So some patients report this continuous burning sensation. Other patients can say, no, I feel numb and I get these lightning attacks of pain that last a few seconds and, and then they go away and I don't have the long-term burning. So you can do it with symptoms perhaps or um, there are various measurements we can make and see how numb they are, see what they can feel. And that may enable us to predict which drugs work in some patients and which drugs won't in others. At the moment, it's trial and error. We try that drug, if it works, then we've got there. But usually we have to go through two or three drugs before we find one that best suits our patient. The other problem is that although we've got a lot of new drugs and they're somewhat effective, they're only modestly effective. I mean, if I tell you that 
the best of the drugs we have only gives 50% pain relief in every three or four patients treated. That's not very impressive, to be honest. So there's a long way to go in terms of developing new drugs. But one of the ways might do that is to target them to specific patient groups. And there's emerging research to tell us that that might be important. I mean, one of the issues that people with neuropathic pain face is that sometimes the treatment is worse than the disease, or not worse than the condition, but makes life unbearable. You're absolutely right. Uh, most of the drugs we have in our, in our ammunition pouch, if you like, have side effects. Usually uh, you get side effects at the dose that we need to treat the pain, and they're not ideal. Take a drug called amitriptyline, for example, which is commonly used for neuropathic pain. It's, it's quite effective, um, but most people tend to get side effects, particularly the elderly, and it may um, stop someone driving a car, for example. Now, we might have made their pain a bit better, but it's someone who can't, can no longer drive their car, that makes them much more socially isolated. So the balance may be that they would stop taking the drug because having the pain relief put them in a worse situation than not having the pain relief. Professor Andrew Rice. Now, I'm just reading through the patient leaflet that comes in each packet of amitriptyline and the possible side effects that range from dizziness, confusion, fits, hepatitis, diarrhea, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, and on and on and on. Enough to frighten the living daylights out of anyone who fails to read the caveat that, as the leaflet says, all medicines can cause side effects, although not everybody gets them. I certainly experienced several of those side effects. A medicines review with my local pharmacist helped me identify them and put my mind to rest. But it's a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? Too much information, which could lead the patient to forego a highly effective and generally safe treatment, or too little information that I suspect the lawyers would have something to say about. Sheena Derry is Senior Scientific Officer in the Pain Research Unit in Oxford. I met her at the 2015 British Pain Society Annual Scientific Meeting, where she was speaking about problems in identifying harm from medical interventions and how best to present information on harm to the user. The dictionary definition of the verb to harm is to damage or injure somebody or something. There's a clear implication of cause and effect there, and in medicine it isn't always that simple. And one of the problems that we have in looking at harm uh, with medical interventions is determining what adverse symptoms, adverse events are caused by the intervention and which are naturally occurring. People can experience adverse symptoms even if they're not taking medication. And some of those symptoms are the same as the symptoms people experience as a result of taking medication. And one of the problems when we're trying to assess harm in medicine is trying to work out which of the events are due to the intervention and which would happen anyway. It's not always easy to do. In fact, it's usually not easy to do. There are other factors which can influence the harm that people experience. In what way? Well, for example, we know that participants in blinded clinical trials report adverse events even when they're taking an inert placebo. Now, they have to be told about potential adverse events when they enter the trial and they receive the same information as the people who get the active treatment. And there are studies that show that people report experience and report precisely the adverse events they've been led to believe they might experience if they were taking the active treatment. So at a very basic level, if I open my, my packet of, of whatever I might be taking and look through the, all the side effects that it could give me, if that was a placebo, it should have no effect on me whatsoever. Yeah. I could experience the drowsiness, the whatever. You could, but we wouldn't necessarily know whether you did experience the drowsiness anyway, or whether you're experiencing the drowsiness because you've seen it written down and it's been suggested to you. The trick would be not to suggest it to me. It would, and that's a dilemma that doctors have. There are doctors who say to me, that they sometimes think that because they legally have to tell their patients about potential adverse events, 
they worry sometimes that they're actually causing events that the patient may otherwise not experience. That actually is, is very pertinent because when you do read the list of possible risks of adverse events, you begin to wonder in real life, is this caused by the tablet? Am I drowsy because I'm tired? Mm. Am I feeling nauseous because I've had some bad food or something? You could become a hypochondriac just by reading you could. it. And there are patients who look at the list of adverse events and patient inflammation leaflets and say, I'd rather have the problem <laughs> not, and not bother with the medication and have this whole other set of things to deal with. They have to be listed there by law. People have to be informed. It doesn't mean that you will experience them, but clearly some people do if they're suggested. But there's some very interesting work going on at the moment on how well adverse events are reported in clinical trials, which is badly, I have to say. And there are initiatives to try to improve that. Beyond that, there are attempts to, for example, start collecting core outcome data for specific therapeutic areas so that in clinical trials people are collecting the same information in the same way so that we can then combine the trials together in a meta-analysis and get more robust answers because at the moment what's happening a lot of the time is that while different trials may be kind of measuring the same thing they're measuring perhaps a slightly different thing or they're measuring it in a slightly different way, which then makes it impossible to combine it for a meta-analysis, or even just to compare it with another trial. Somebody once told me that the perfect drug would have no side effects, would hit the spot for whatever it was taken, and you wouldn't need the little slip inside that says you're gonna have diarrhea, you're gonna be constipated, all in the same go, and this, that, the other. Or even that it probably won't work. <laughs> or even that it won't work, yes. Which is the likelihood that you won't get the benefit either. It's all about putting it into perspective. Mm. Mm. And there's no point in considering harm on its own unless whatever you're doing is so rare that you can just dismiss it. You know, I had one slide up today where I had the risk of death from a gastrointestinal bleed and risk of death from a heart attack that was associated with the use of an NSAID. And that risk was coming in at around about the same as the risk of dying from any accident. I then put up the risk, the chance of the benefit. In this case, it was 50% pain relief. And that's coming in very high at about one in two. When you see it visually like that, you might think, well, that seems worthwhile. But if that benefit was way down near where those risks were, those risks take on a whole new dimension, don't they? You can't consider one without the other, really. There's always going to be a trade-off, one against the other. I had another slide where I looked at how patients do that trade-off. What do they decide is an acceptable risk? So they looked at patients with osteoarthritis and they asked them what maximum risk increment would you be prepared to accept for each of a number of different adverse events in a trade-off for increased pain relief? So they were offered an increase in pain relief of two out of 10 or five out of 10. And they were asked, how much risk increment would you accept? And as you'd expect, they were prepared to accept a bigger risk increment for the less severe adverse events. So um, edema and dyspepsia were the two I had up. And they're also prepared to accept a bigger risk increment for a bigger amount of pain relief. So they were prepared to go higher for five out of 10 than they would for two out of 10. But within those general observations, there was a huge variation between individual patients in what they felt was an acceptable risk increment. So it's impossible to tell where any individual patient is going to balance that benefit and harm. And where they decide to balance it now may change six months down the line. You know, it changes with time, it changes with circumstance. So it's a very fluid thing and it's a very individual choice as well.
Shinaderi, Senior Scientific Officer in the Pain Research Unit in Oxford. She brought up the topic of the placebo effect and the psychological influence it can have on a patient's pain. Dr Lena Weser is a psychologist based in Denmark and placebo and pain is her area of expertise. Now, I thought that a placebo used in blind clinical trials or even to placate a demanding patient by prescribing an inert medicine relied on deception. If the subject or patient thinks it's the real thing, it may or may not have the same outcome as the genuine article. It has been a common understanding that placebo only works if patients are fooled and they don't know it's a placebo. But no one had actually tested that up until recently. So uh, a group by Ted Kapchuk, uh, located at Harvard, they have conducted studies both within pain and antidepressive medicine, where they have told patients, what we're giving you now is a sugar pill. It's what we call a placebo. There is no active ingredient in it. But we know that if people believe that this may have an effect, they may be able to activate their own descending pain modulating system. And then they took time to talk with the patient and ask how they felt and express empathy. And there it turned out that even though people knew it was a placebo, it did have a pain relieving effect. That's astonishing. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're a psychologist. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, it's simply that patient's perception of a treatment does influence the pain experience to a high extent. But the patient knows that there is no treatment. Yeah, but still they are in a good treatment context, meeting a nice doctor who takes time to talk about their symptom and express empathy and tell them that this might be something that might help someone and it might even help them. The fact that a patient is speaking to a doctor who may have a white coat on whatever he may be in a hospital situation, the fact that he is there says something to him, I am being taken seriously. Exactly, yeah. And we also have the opposite effect. Ulrike Bingel has conducted a very nice study where she gave active pain medication, remifentanil, to patients, which is known in a dozen of studies to reduce pain. But then she told the people that this is going to increase your pain, which was actually a lie because the pharmacology of remifentanil works on reducing pain. But there she saw that the pain was increased. So it simply tells us that patients' perception of the treatment situation is also working on either reducing or enhancing the pain. So what we really want is to have their own perception work along with the pain treatment we are giving and not work against it. So as a psychologist, how do you do that? Well, first of all, it's important to know that patient's perception of a treatment actually matters. It's not something you can just like sometimes when you're in a hospital setting and you're very busy and uh, you have a lot uh, on your schedule and you only see a patient for a short period of time, then it's important to know that the patient's perception of this treatment actually also matters. So all the basic things, taking time to talk with the patient and hear how they're feeling and tell them what is this treatment going to do for them, that matters. What does that mean for the health professional? How can he or she use that? A lot of clinicians are really good at at this and if they have good time they most of them would do it naturally but sometimes they are under pressure and they don't have a lot of time and then we can be so focused that we think that the medicine is going to do all the work by itself so we just prescribe some medicine and give it to the patient and then they are out the door we should try to avoid that and instead always have time to talk with the patient hear how they're feeling hear about their expectation and their emotions and try to optimize them in a realistic manner so the patient's own pain modulation can work alongside with the pain medication we're prescribing. So it's a matter for the doctor to sit down, just take an interest in the patient rather than be clicking away on his computer screen and, and looking over this, that, the other. Yeah. It's common sense, isn't it? Yeah, it is absolute common sense, but now we can show it on brain imaging and all <laughs> other stuff that it actually matters. It's the great thing about science is, is that <laughs> common sense isn't believed until yeah. you see it on the computer. Yeah. <laughs> That was Dr. Lena Faser. And I'll just remind you that whilst we in Pain Concern believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound, based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you and your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. Don't forget that you can download all editions and transcripts of Air in Pain from Pain Concerns website, and that is 
painconcern.org.uk. Now, cast your mind back to the beginning of this edition of Airing Pain, and you'll remember that Professor Andrew Rice raised the topic of phantom limb pain. He's collaborating with medical historian Dr Emily Mayhew of Imperial College to see what can be learned from the cases of British soldier amputees in the First World War. After the First World War, there were 41,000 surviving amputees. That's actually enough to fill Stamford Bridge, Chelsea Football Club's ground to give you some idea of the magnitude of it. And these people lived, they were young men at that time, they had pretty much normal life expectancies. And there was a lot of focus on artificial limb technology, and, and that improved dramatically over the course of um, their rehabilitation. So at the beginning of the First World War, you had artificial limbs that were little more than wooden peg legs. By the end of the First World War, you actually had ones with joints, they were articulated. A huge technological advance. But their pain was largely ignored. Now, we know that a large proportion of them must have had phantom limb pain, and others of them had a type of pain in the amputation stump, where anything touched a damaged nerve in the amputation stump, uh, it would give them a lot of pain. And obviously that means that fitting their false leg was quite difficult. But their pain was ignored. And there are two points of this that are relevant to modern day life. The first is that all the systems for assessing pensions, disability pensions, were based on what they could measure physically. So if you had one leg missing, you got less pension than if you had two legs. If you had an amputation above the knee, you got a higher pension than someone who had one below the knee. So it was an easy way of assessing the disability. They didn't assess pain at all as a disability. And I think to some regards, we're often in that situation still today because pain is difficult to measure. The second aspect of it is that damage to limbs and amputations and damage to nerves and limbs was the single most survivable injury, biggest survivable injury of the First World War. If you were injured in the chest or the head, your chances of survival were quite poor. But most of the people who survived with injuries had uh, damage to their legs or arms. That is exactly the same uh, today with conflicts. We see it both in victims of landmines in places like Cambodia and Sierra Leone, but we also see it in returning soldiers from Afghanistan. And what has changed through doctors in the military particularly, Dominic Aldington is one of them, uh, they recognise pain much more as a disability now than they did. So these soldiers are more likely to tell you about their pain and they're more proactive about managing it than they were a hundred years ago. So we've learned something about it then, but it's still the same injury as it was a hundred years ago. Nothing has changed from that point of view. That was Professor Andrew Rice. Now, taking up the point he was making, the next two editions of Airing Pain, along with articles in our sister magazine, Pain Matters, will be devoted to supporting the needs of veterans injured in service. I'll leave you with the words of Army veteran Michael Clough, whose horrific injuries following a parachute accident in Afghanistan resulted in an amputation and CRPS. That's Chronic Regional Pain Syndrome. It's embedded into you from the day that you join the military that you're a fighting soldier. People carry on with broken bones, sprained ankles. It's just a part of way of life that is embedded into you that you continue to fight. That is like, you know, installed into you very from the day you walk through the door at training camp. So if you turn around to a clinician at the head of the court and you say, you have got severe pain, they know that you have got severe pain, that you're not just sort of saying, I've got severe pain for the sake of it, you know, for the sake of it, you have actually got severe pain of some type. Do you think that GPs in civilian life don't understand that? Yeah, I think some of them believe that you are in the pain that you say that you're in. The pain team in the military, Colonel Aldington and Sarah Lewis, the, the nurse, I think they will have provided the GP with enough information. The only trouble is, is that I think that the transfer of information is, is all done paperwork wise. A phone call would represent far better than paperwork being submitted via emails and things like that would be because you can't tell a story via written paper. I think it's very difficult for them to explain somebody's pain condition via a written text format. I think it'd be better for them to ring them up and say, you know, I've got a soldier who's leaving the military now, he's got severe pain conditions, this is what he's tried, these are the paths that we've gone down with him and, and, and his pain condition is real. Ten seconds of talking there says more than 2,000 words would do on a, on a written text page.